Okay, so it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce my old friend, Gyan Hanot. Um, so he is the, he's an example of a very successful theoretical physicist who has um, jumped uh, fields and become a very successful uh, biologist. And um, so, you know, in his earlier uh, incarnation as a theoretical physicist, he has even uh, written papers on string theory with me. Mm, so, he, uh, so let me uh, uh, tell you a little bit about again, and I'm reading talks so that I don't mess up with the terminology. So Gyan is a computational biologist He's currently doing research in cancer, transitional medicine, population genetics. So he was trained as a theoretical physicist, as I said. He did research in academic settings in particle physics, statistical mechanics, and lattice gauge theory, geometric string theory. And before moving to uh, industry to work on parallel topics. Leoed into biology in 2000 after reading his daughter's uh, AP Biotics book. <laughs> <laughs> um, he switched to using physics ideas to solve problems in biology that biologists care about and not on biology inspired physics. He's currently a tenured professor at Rutgers University, the joint appointments in the departments of molecular biology and biochemistry and physics and astronomy. He is also a member of the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. He works closely with physicians and researchers at many universities and medical institutions worldwide to help find ways in, to improve treatment outcomes in diseases such as cancer. Now, let me also tell you that Gyan uh, is a fantastic speaker and he's the um, colloquium, the Institute colloquium, uh, many years ago uh, on human migration. Is still remembered and talked about. So you will uh, find uh, an example of such a uh, talk today. Tomorrow he is giving an institute to him, and uh, the end of this uh, uh, a -A and uh, end of February, I think 26th of yeah. February, um, on the Science Day, he is giving a popular talk uh, also in GIF. Uh, I think so, yeah. 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 So uh, please do come and uh, uh, you know, get your personal experience of uh, how this is done by this mm -hmm. right, so thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Gautam, for allowing me to come and for giving me this, making me a string theory. <laughs> Never thought I would. We just worked on matrix models before string theory was nice. Uh, okay, so. Can I have a show of hands for how many are biologists here? Are there any biologists? Only one. <laughs> Students count as biologists, right? Huh? You're doing an experiment in a lab. So you're all physicists except for Rulas. Wow. Well, basically, you're the only one who can correct me. <laughs> 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 I've got this talk, and I'll be a few more No, you haven't heard the first half of it. Okay. Then you can be. Okay, so yes, so so when I started physics, uh, it was in probably when none of you were, was born. Uh, so I did my PhD in 1979 from Cornell, and I worked on phenomenology. In those days, the J psi had been discovered, but the epsilon had not been discovered. And of course, the W and the Z. And the Higgs were just the dream. Uh, there was super symmetry. There was a hierarchy problem, which I understand is still a problem. Uh, and you know, I was happy with physics for a long time. I did postdocs at Brookhaven Lab, the Institute for Advanced Study, CERN, ITP, you know, lots of postdocs, and those in fact to find jobs. Finally, I got a job at FSU as a, in, on the faculty, but I hated to live in Florida. So I had a tenure job, but I said, I hate this. And like a stupid person, probably not so stupid, I left and I joined a company called Thinking Machines. And one of the reasons I joined Thinking Machines is that Feynman's son used to work there, Carl Feynman. 
And Feynman used to go there. You remember there was this Challenger disaster where Feynman was on a committee where he showed them that uh, there was an O-ring, the O-ring was snapped. So during weekends, he would go to thinking machines to design the router for the supercomputer they were designing. And I was intrigued by that and I got a job offer, so I left. And that was the best choice, the decision of my life. Living in Boston was very different from living in Florida. Uh, I mean, India is kind of more or less homogeneous, but the US is not. If you live on the East Coast or the West Coast, you have the wrong sense of what the country is like. Uh, the South and the middle part of the country, except Chicago, is not worth living in. So anyway, <laughs> really true. How many of you have lived in Alabama? <laughs> you don't want to live in Alabama. I can tell you many stories. Anyway, so after that, um, at some point, thinking machines, like most startups, went belly up. And my friends rescued me and got me a job at IBM Research in Yorktown Heights. By then, we had moved to Princeton because my wife hated the cold weather in Boston. And uh, the institute made me a, a visiting member and gave us housing, which is very important. So I've lived there ever since. And uh, in, in 2000, as Bhagavan said, it, it is really true that I read my daughter's textbook and I decided I wanted to be a biologist. And, and at that point, my manager told me that if you insist, then you know you have to fire you because you cannot be a biologist at IBM unless you prove that you're a biologist by writing some papers. So I took a year off on sabbatical. I took some courses with Upfield and with other people at Princeton. And I also joined the lab. Uh, and in the lab, I worked with uh, an Israeli postdoc on uh, endocytosis. He means it's swallow. Endocytosis is when something gets swallowed. So from the cell surface, things get swallowed when they are turned on. And, and that basically signals from the outside to the inside of the cell and turns the cell on. So there's B cell endocytosis that we, we modeled. And we wrote a paper and we felt that we were biologists. <laughs> and that was enough to fool IBM into believing it. So I moved back to IBM and became a biologist. And I'm still learning biology because unlike physics, there is no core curriculum that I have taken. You know, I've taken usual courses a lot. You took classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, field theory one, field theory two. Uh, and there's no such, in my day, there was no course in string theory. So I never took a course in string theory. But, you know, electrodynamics, statistical mechanics, anybody, the whole gamut. But I have taken not a single course in biology. So I learned from talking to brilliant minds like Ullas and other people here. And they're very kind. Biologists are very kind. They're not driven by the desire to know the mind of God, like physicists are. And I mean, they don't even know how things work. And, and so uh, they, they are happy to share their knowledge in such a vast subject that there are many low hanging fruits. And I've been picking these fruits for some time now. So I'm going to tell you about how physicists can do biology. And it's not me that I'm going to talk about, but my physics students. So most of the students that I've had have been physicists. And some of them have stayed in biology. Actually, most of them have stayed in biology. A couple of them went to Wall Street and became very rich <laughs> or, or became, became consultants. Actually, one of the people from here, from the biology department here, has joined uh, McKinsey's, which is this firm that consults and she travels, at, you know, stays in ridiculous places. Uh, and some people go to Wall Street and make big bucks, but most of them actually are like us. You know, they wear clothes like this, they have sandals on their feet, and they basically do whatever they feel like. So I will show you some examples of this. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, oh, I can use this. Right, so for some reason now, it does not work. But like this. Does this have to be turned on? Oh, oh. I can go with the. that something is here. No. I can't even escape. Yeah, I think if you come out of the screen, maybe something will happen. I have to escape from all this. 
Okay. We need some experts. Yeah, so we think, and I can say that. I'm standing here also because I think we were discussing about how in principle we may create more balanced students to talk to these students and more students. So you don't have to think about this and you don't have to focus. But so there are probably not so low on inputs as very important. Biologists cannot solve uh, because simply biology. Pain doesn't allow you, and it's so many different parameters to think about. We are really collecting information. How to pass out that information is something that uh, you know, we can't do. So, and some of this definitely have a lot more important for biology, but we also have you know, some universal information on how, how noisy systems behave, um, how order and chaos work together. Something that you guys might relate to, right? Um, things like one like this, right? Will they operate in biology to be to age related diseases or, or aging itself? So these are things a world concept, right? and we would like to see if we can bring more biologists and physicists together in whatever ways. One of the things that I'm currently doing now is yeah. I could be creating. At least one to two months, yeah. we might have buy this to this audience. Maybe they'll come and make up for ourselves, hopefully, or not. And then maybe give them discussions. If physicists are interested, we would love to. I think, I think it's a good idea. We'll, we'll, we'll yeah. right one to two months, one of us, even chemists, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be biologists, anybody. We don't have to do anything at all. None of you have to do biology at all. You know, the, the unique thing about physicists is that we learn just enough to solve a problem. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so, so whenever I do biology problem, biologists tell me a whole bunch of stuff, which stuff, which resonates in my head, and, and then I try to move that into some simple thing. I say, oh, okay, so I can understand this part of it, and and how, what do I need to do to solve that? Yes. And usually that's enough to get going. Right? It's not enough to solve the problem, but it's enough to get the biologists to talk to talk to. And we make models. So we simplify because we're not smart enough to accept all these different things. We don't know enough. At least it keeps the dialogue going. And I know famous examples of people talking very extended biology. Is there a reverse example? No, very, very, very. Because they are afraid of math. It's not about whether we are good or bad. It's just this fear of math. Yeah. Because unfortunately, you go away from, you go to biology more from Right? It's not because you're good at the bad man. So there are very few people who don't want to mind uh, challenging them, but very, very, very few. Yeah. And then it becomes like In fact, okay. uh, whenever I write a paper with a biologist, especially a famous biologist, and there's a, if there's one equation in the paper, they will ask me to move that to. <laughs> <laughs> So that we want to even think about. Right? Yeah, nobody would read your paper if you have an equation there. <laughs> yeah. So they have alternative equations, and okay, that's good enough. Then now I can't. Yeah. It looks impressive. So what they tell you is that you should write a paper just on a method, method that you have, which you can publish in any journal at all. And then you publish this biology paper with no equations. But you point to this journal and say, if you want to know the details, you go there. <laughs> go there. But they trust you. <laughs> Okay, so let me see. So I'm going to first talk about uh, dietary pressure and genetic adaptation in the Masa. And don't worry if you don't understand any of the words, and you will understand as time goes on. So like in biology, there are always many, many people who are involved. And I just want to start by showing you the people involved. Uh, so there's a picture somewhere. Oh yeah, this one. Yeah, so these two are the ones, the physicists who did the work. This guy's a mathematician. This guy's a string theorist. You may have read his papers. 
he's now on Wall Street. Uh, this guy's a mathematician. This guy's a computer scientist, computer scientist, computer scientist, medical doctor, oncologist. This guy's an anthropologist. This is a famous biologist who's, a, who's discovered a gene called P53. And this guy is an undergraduate student who just was hanging around and got his name on the paper. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the lab lady who did the experiment that we need to do. So there's always many people involved. Okay, so these are the two who actually did the work, and, and I will talk about the work more. So before I do, I have to give you some background. Since most of you are physicists, and I apologize to all uh, you know, biology has to do with evolution, things change. And this is proof that things change because this is the old, this is the young Darwin and the old Darwin. <laughs> okay, so and much of, much of biology in your body happens in this complicated thing called the eukaryotic cell, which is full of stuff and it's all jostling around. There's a nucleus here and there's a whole bunch of stuff in the cytoplasm. And you do not want to know much of, about this, right? So let's move on. You, you need to know that there are some number of chromosomes in your body. Each one of you has 22 pairs of some things called autosomes, which just means non-sex chromosomes and two sex chromosomes. So 46 in all. In fact, biologists are so poor at math that initially they thought there were 48 chromosomes. Some poor graduate student counted it. It's, it's really true. <laughs> the early textbooks also said that humans have 48 chromosomes. Then some, you know, left wing. <laughs> he actually did the count multiple times and told his advisor that there are only 46. <laughs> and nobody believed him for a while until they counted themselves. And he said, oh, geez. So after that, the textbooks all say there are 46. <laughs> okay, and of course, they're ordered in size to make sense, except for the Y chromosome, which is tiny, and the X chromosome, which is huge. Okay. So uh, the important thing for this part of the talk is that you are all a shuffled copy of your grandparents, not of your parents, but of your grandparents, if you think about it. Because the shuffling happens uh, before you are born in your germline. And so you get mixed up, really mixed up. And then of course you give half to your children, the half from the others from the spouse. So that's the only important thing to know is that recombination is, it happening all the time. In fact, there's an, it's obligatory combination. If you do not do recombination for the germline, then the cell lines are deleted, cells are deleted. So you have to have recombination. And obviously the reason for that is viruses. So you come to my talk tomorrow and you know why we, we have sexual reproductions to avoid viruses. We, we pass on immunity to the next generation. Okay, so allele is, is, a, is a locus. Is, is, is a, every locus on the genome has four possible choices, A, C, G, T. And uh, so let's say this is a part of the chromosome. This is some allele A. And after it mutates, you have now, some people in the population will have A and some people will have something else. So uh, populations evolve by having mutations. Now the mutation rate is very low. It's about 10 to minus nine to 10 to minus 10 per base per replication, but your genome is huge, six billion bases. So you have about six changes, three to six changes every generation, I mean, every, every journal. So this is not a trivial thing. Okay. And then the leaves that arise one after the other from mutation. And so the genome gets more and more complicated. As time goes on. And then there's, of course, recombination, as I said. So things get shuffled as well. So, what does that all, all that mean? It means that every piece of your genome came from some other ancestor. You go backward in time, then you can, you can, you can see that every part of your genome. So, when somebody says, Oh, I'm pure this, I'm pure Brahmin, or I'm pure something else, or I'm pure South Indian, or pure Bengali, no such thing. You are from everywhere. In fact, two to the n increases exponentially with n. So in a thousand generations, and thousand generations is only 20,000 years, 
actually 40 generations is enough. 40 generations is 2,000 years. Your ancestors came from everywhere because the number of people who you descended from is more than the number of people that have ever been alive. So this whole business of which is my homeland, where do I belong, what is my native language, how special am I? <laughs> You're not special. I'm not special either. Yeah, one question is numbers that you get. Yeah. Okay, from my name. Are they uh, relatively constant if you go down from humans to be from what's in third? No. Right? No, no. The reason we have such a low nutrition rate is that we do something called editing. So every time you copy the genome, it's like, you know, on the computer, there is uh, you, whenever you send a message, that message is actually sent more than once. And if there's a difference, it's sent a third time, right? And you check majority rule. So the genome does the same thing. When it copies the genome, there's an arm of the genome, and I'll show you that, uh, which actually checks for error. And if there's an error, it goes back and fixes it. Whereas bacteria don't do this. So bacteria have a much higher nutrition rate than we do. Okay. And the reason is that we are more complicated. So we cannot tolerate mutations, and they can, because you know, one bacterium dies, who cares? There are thousands of them uh, around. Okay, so I'm going to look for signatures of selection, and I'll tell you what selection is, is, is in a moment. So let's say you are special. You can do string theory, or you solve some, you know, one of them. <laughs> Or you solve one of the clay problems, or you know, or, or you one of the Hilbert problems, or you are very attractive, or you're very rich. So you you will amplify, or you are Chinese Khan. So you kill people and you take away their wives. Okay. In that case, what will happen is your genome will amplify because you have lots of progeny. As a result, any selection that causes you to be special, you know, solve math problems, will amplify. And that region would amplify. So your whole chromosome will be overrepresented. In fact, 16% of people who live in Pakistan and, and Afghanistan share ancestry with Genghis Khan. Uh, the Y chromosome is the same. The Y chromosome does not evolve. It just accumulates mutations, but you can tell that it's the same chromosome. And so, but I'm not talking about the Y chromosome. I'm talking about uh, real regions which have selective um, mutations. Okay, so. So, so yeah. this question you mean some specific skills? Well, no, the ability. Let's say you, you you your diet changes, or there is climate change, and you know temperature rises. Um, if your body can adapt to to the changes that happen in the environment, or let's say a lot of, lot more mosquitoes come about, it turns out that there's a, there's a mutation on the CC CCR5 gene. Uh, which protects against HIV. Nobody knows where this came from, but that locus is selected in 11% of Europeans who have this mutation and they cannot get AIDS. They can get HIV, but they cannot get AIDS because the virus is not effective in entering the cell. So there's a kind of mutation I'm talking about. Something which confers an advantage. It's not de deliberate, like string theory, as the example. <laughs> Because biology is not selective. It's not selecting me or you or anyone. Evolution has no goal, right? But it could be by serendipity that you have something. And, and that will amplify if the right circumstances come about. Right. So, what does the like, right criteria for amplification or when will it suppress? Like, there will be some things that will suppress and there will be something that will just. Yeah, so if you have a mutation that, let's say, predisposes you to disease. Right. If you have a mutation in, in the mitochondria, which uh, cause you to, to be not able to process, to, to generate energy, then you will not live long run. Sickle cell anemia is another one. If you have a mutation in one of the genes that is part of hemoglobin, then uh, you will not be able to, uh, to, to breathe properly. Basically, your, blood cells, your red blood cells won't work. And so if you have a single allele, you're fine. If you have two alleles, which are the bad ones, then you will have this disease called sickle cell anemia and you won't live. You won't live past the age of 19, not enough to, to procreate. So the goal of evolution is just to keep you alive until you can make a copy of your gene. Other than that, evolution doesn't care about us. 
Think about that. It's, it's a scary thought. The other scary thought is most of the development that, that has happened in you has happened already by the time you're born. The most interesting part of your life was in the womb. Once you're born, all you're doing is maintenance. You're just keeping yourself alive until you make a copy of yourself, and then you're irrelevant. It's a scary fact, but it's a fact. Okay, anyway, so recombination breaks down these selected reasons. So let's say you are amplified for some reason. Over time, that amplification, although the locus will be there, but the reasons will shorten. But that means that there is some time span over which you can observe the effects of selection. Not too far, far out in the back, right? But there should be some time span. Okay, so I'm going back to the Maasai. So the Maasai are these people who live in Tanzania and Kenya. And their traditional diet consists of milk, blood, and sometimes meat. And they basically love their cows. You know, they, they hurt by pastoral people. They love the, the cattle. And you can see this Maasai drawing blood in a gourd from a, a nick in the cow's ne neck to give away. And, and then you will see in the next slide, the little girl is drinking this mixture of blood and milk. This is their standard diet. Okay, now, in the 1971, there was a paper published in New England Journal of Medicine that described some special characteristics of the Maasai. And so what they found is that the x-axis is age, the y-axis is uh, cholesterol, total serum cholesterol levels, and this shows you the, the, the curve for US males, and this is US females, and does that, can you, anyone tell me why there is a crossover? Not you. Why is it, something happens at 45. Menopause. Menopause. Menopause, so estrogen protects women against high cholesterol, and that menopause, estrogen stops, and so we take over. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, women live longer than us anyway, because <laughs> most of you are, are, are men, so the, the ones who will, so you will all survive by the time we all <laughs> Notice that the Maasai have very low levels of cholesterol, and they don't take any, uh, any, any statins, or they, they're not careful about their diet. They just drink that milk and blood. Uh, and this is independent of age. We somehow you know, don't increase like other people. By the way, this US graph is not special. It's only the same in India. And I suspect a lot of the older people here are taking statins. What about male female ratio in Masai? Uh, so it's the same graph they will follow? Oh, yeah. Males and females, uh, no difference. Uh, in in Masai. Masai. OK, so that's a separate lecture. I can prove to you that the optimal ratio of male to female is one to one at reproductive success, right? At birth, there are more men born than women. And the reason is very simple, because male sperm swims faster. It's, it's smaller. The Y chromosome is smaller than the X chromosome. It swims faster, it fertilizes faster. But then over time, at, at reproductive success, the male female ratio is one. And then afterwards, we decline. So then it gets less than one. But that's just that, that has just to do with simple, simple biology. It's just simple selection. You can, it's optimization theory, which you can prove. Okay. And if you look at the atherosclerotic index, which is the degree to which your uh, coronary arteries are occluded, you can see that as time goes on, all of us uh, increase. That the amount of plaque we have in our coronary arteries, but the Maasai are down here. They're all down here. They have no plaque at all in their coronary arteries. So this was strange. And then they never get gallstones. They never have gallstones. And certainly cholesterol-related gallstones. In fact, if you take bile from a Maasai and you put a gallstone in the bile, it dissolves. Which means that they have something special in their bile, which dissolves uh, cholesterol. And of course, they have very high levels of, of immune uh, markers. So, they, and that's probably because they live in uh, aseptic conditions. Okay, so the summary is that they are, they are a, a, a group of people that is close. They are 
They, they eat a lot of calories per day. 66% of them come from fat, about two grams of cholesterol per day. And they never get atherosclerosis. Uh, their cholesterol levels are, are low and, and flat, and they get no gallstones and they have low blood pressure. Kind of the ideal thing, right? You, know, you go to a doctor and you have all these properties, they'll tell you just to go home and do whatever it is that you're doing. And they have early immune activation. All right. Sorry, but some of this just the lifestyle. You're running yeah, yeah. after tiger and lions all the time. Something. No, they, they, they only kill lions once in their life. And the, after that, they wear the mane on their head. Sorry. So, so that was the first thing that was suggested. So what, what, what is the average lifestyle? Um, 65, 70, something like that. But you can get very old too. You can get very old ones. Depends on how many cattle you have. <laughs> and the ones with a lot of because they can stay at home. But all the big things, but average age is still. No, the average age is 70. You know, by, by 70, most of us have, have high blood pressure, uh, heart, heart disease, what do you want? I had, I had the, the plot there. But that plot is for people who uh, had an accident, right? So, so they, they don't go to the hospital. So it, it, these are these are people. Who, so I don't really know the, the lifestyle of a Maasai. Or good question. I have to check. Them. I'm sure that I can ask my friend Lee Kronk. He will tell me. Okay. So so they asked what is what's going on, and they decided to do what biologists call a case control experiment. And here's the experiment that they did. They took 12 Maasai in control and 11 in case for eight weeks. They gave them a spe specific diet. This is the diet. Corn syrup, vegetable fat, so no cholesterol. Corn, beans, sugar, and mazola. And we told them, you sit here, we'll feed you. You can walk around, do whatever you want to do. You don't have to work. It's all free. So of course, they sat there and they ate the diet. Then the experimental group was fed two grams of crystalline cholesterol. You know, And both groups were fed uh, radioactively labeled carbon-14 labeled cholesterol to be illegal, should have been illegal, but was not. So this allowed them to actually monitor how much of the cholesterol was labeled and how much of it was, was synthesized by the liver. If you don't eat any cholesterol, you will still make cholesterol. Because you cannot live without cholesterol, your, your, your system needs cholesterol and the liver can synthesize it. Okay. And then they took serum and people's samples for eight weeks and followed up for six, six months and measured everything. And here's what they found. They found that, uh, so this is the control group and this is the experimental group. The rate of synthesis from the liver for the control group was this much. For the experimental group was half of that. The rate of absorption for the control group was zero because they never got any cholesterol from the diet. But the rate of absorption for the experimental group was exactly what would balance what they were not synthesizing. And the total cholesterol was the same. Which means that they have some sensory mechanism to sense dietary cholesterol and stop producing cholesterol, which we don't have. If you eat cheeseburgers every day or eat ghee and mithai, no, yes. you also have it. Huh? It's very long. Yes. This method that shuts it off. This well? Yeah. Oh, it's not bad. Okay. Yeah. Your gut and liver cross I talked with each other. Okay, fine. But I don't want to test this because I'm already on on, on <laughs> All right. So they, what what this group said is that this leads us to believe without direct proof they have some different genetic traits. All right. So possible explanations: some special factor in milk. That's one choice. The other is what. What Sandeep said, that maybe physical fitness and freedom from emotional stress. <laughs> yeah, and then, uh, or some bitter herbs that they eat, herbs that they eat, and plants that they eat in soup. But we thought that maybe it's their altered genetics and maybe we can do something about that. <clears throat> okay. And they have unusual social customs, as I will show you. Okay. So it turns out that there was a project at that time when these two students, so I had two students, Atish Bhatia and Shitish Wal, who came to me. Atish was a string theorist, works for one of the string theorists at breakfast. There are many of them there too. 
And uh, after two years of working, he was told that, well, some people can do strings and some people cannot do strings. And so he, he got the message and he, he came and he said, I, I cannot do strings. Uh, and the other one was working on the condo problem for Nathan Andre, who's a good guy. He's done many good projects on the condo problem. And Nathan gave a problem. And she just proved that you cannot solve this problem using the condo method, You're using the ansatz. And so Nathan said, that's it. After three years, you have no, nothing new. You have to find some of the answers. <laughs> so he also gave the no, but it's that happens. You know, what can you do? So, uh, so there was this HapMath project where they took 1,301 people, um, different groups. So you can see the groups here: uh, Utah residents from Europe, Italians from Tuscany. I wonder why they chose that. Uh, you have to go there and select sample, collect samples, bring some wines. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then Japanese from Tokyo again. You know, some sushi. <laughs> Asian Gujaratis from Houston. That is. <laughs> and then Mexicans from Los Angeles, uh, um, African Americans from Southwest USA, um, and so three tribes from one from Kenya, the Luya, the Yoruba from Nigeria, and the Maasai from Kenya. The Yoruba, by the way, live on the other side. Masai live on in East Africa and Yoruba live in West Africa. They're separated by the whole continent. Okay, so they did SNP chips on these, about 100, uh, 1.5 million SNPs. SNP is a polymorphism, a mutation at some locus. And they looked at SNPs that were reasonably frequent, but not too frequent, because a SNP that has low frequency is useless. A SNP that has high frequency is equally useless. Somewhere in between. And you want something to be distributed equally across these populations. So that's what they should chose. Okay. And then they what do you mean? SNP? What's what's the SNP? SNP is a is a change in a locus. So let's say I take all the people in this room and I sequence your genome and I put them all together, I align them. So some of you, if I look at a particular lo lo location on your genome, some of you may have an A there, and some of you may have a G there. So that A and G is a polymorphism. And the frequency, the relative frequency of that across this population has to be adjusted because if, if there's only one A, it's not very informative, right? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if everybody is, is an A or high fraction are, are Gs, not. <laughs> so you choose between like 30% and 70% variation SNPs. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that are considered to be, to have content and information. You can also do all sorts of analysis. You can look at uh, um, variance in, across different populations because you want to distinguish these different populations as well. Anyway, they did a good job. The group, this is all done at the project. So okay. Is there a particular characteristic that they are looking for? No, this was done without looking at any characteristic. They, they, they just wanted to make the data available. These were early days when there was no phenotype information. If you want to, to ask that question, you should ask Kulas because that's what he's going to do. He's going to do a, a analysis of, of diets in India. And he's going to look at specific phenotypes. And that would have been the right way to do this. Except those guys had machines and money from the government to sequence things. And so they just kept on sequencing things. But you're right, they had no phenotype information, which makes it useless. Okay, so if you now do principal component analysis, hopefully all of you know what this is. All you do is you think of a high dimensional space in which you, you map these, these SNPs and then you project down in such a way as to maximize the variance and you see groups. And so of course the Japanese and the Chinese more or less are exactly the same. The Africans are here, the Europeans are together and for some reason the Mexicans and the Gujaratis are together. No, I think, I think it's even worse than that. So the Mexicans came from Los Angeles and the Gujaratis came from Houston, but the Gujaratis probably didn't want to give their own blood. So, <laughs> so in fact, they just brought some Mexican workers to come and 
Each each person was paid some money to give their blood, right? And, and they probably gave half to the Mexican. <laughs> and it's in view. Anyway, this doesn't make sense to me. Okay. And, and then if you just take the African samples and just cluster them separately, then you can see that the Maasai, the Yoruba, and the Luya are very different. Are very different. Um, even though these two, these two live in the same area and these two are separated by the whole continent. Yeah. But it means that they are uh, genetically isolated in some sense, each of these. So any polymorphisms you see between them are probably significant for something, not necessarily something that you can predict, but something. Okay, <clears throat> so they are different. All right, so there, there, is, there is a software that allows you to find population admixture. It says, if you, if you take a reference population, let's say Europeans, then what fraction of, how many reference populations do you need to explain the data, right? So you can make a minimum set, and this is the minimal set. You need some number of reference. So this is, a, this is the Ruya, this is African-Americans. You can see that they are like the Yoruba because a lot of the slaves uh, actually came from uh, East Africa through and, and was exported out from West Africa who ended up in the US. And you can see they have a European admixture from mixing. Um, and they also have some, so the, the Luya had some other characteristic which is different from, from the Africans uh, on the other side of the continent. And the Maasai are very different, which is good for our study because we want to see something in the Maasai. Okay. So it turns out that there are ways to detect natural selection. We use three ways to select natural selection. One of them is obvious. You, you take frequencies of alleles in the Maasai versus reference population. So let's say something is, some characteristic locus is amplified, then its frequency will be higher in the Maasai compared to the reference population. And you need, a, you need a baseline population to compare to. So the baseline was neutral SNPs. SNPs in non-coding regions versus coding regions. And then the other method is something called FST, which is a standard technique in biology where you measure identity by descent. So how similar are, so you basically you, you pretend that every locus, what is the likelihood that this locus is related to the previous generation, right? The frequency probability that this locus came from the same, um, from some individual because of selection. Um, and the third one was to look at um, haplotypes. A haplotype is the sequence along the chromosome. So you remember there are two chromosomes. You can have, so it's very hard to figure out the haplotype. And why is that very hard to be thinking? Because what you can measure is genotype. You can measure two, two alleles at every locus, right? A, G, A, C, C. But then from that, you have to reconstruct what is going on on each chromosome, which is not trivial, because you don't have, uh, you don't know which came from where. But you can, there are methods to do it, and there are population genetics methods, which assume maximum likelihood kind of analysis that you can use to do it. So there is math already there, and these guys use it without knowing that they're doing it, right? Click, 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 they just click buttons, seriously. Most of the undergraduates I have were biology majors. They just tell me which button should I click. I don't know. You click the button in your head <laughs> because you're smart enough to do it. It's not hard. Okay. Anyway, so what you're doing here is you're looking at a locus and you're going around the locus to see if there is some signature of amplification of that whole region. If that's true, then in the population everybody would have the same sequence, right, Allah? At least for a while. Yeah. Okay, good. So there is in the details of matter. This was again invented by um, Sabetti. I mean, you know, just like Ed Ritter, there are stories. This lady Sabetti, who is at Harvard, her, her father was the head of Saba. And she, she's a brilliant uh, biologist, but her father is probably a criminal. You know what Saba is, right? The secret police that the Shah had. Anyway, the method works very well. <laughs> so if, if a polymorphism is under selective pressure, positive selection, it will amplify. And SNPs close will also amplify. This is called hitchhiking. 
or genetic gap. And, and over time, recombination will break them up, but as you, as you will see, uh, so these two methods were invented by uh, Betty. And so here are the results from, if you do the, if you do this allele frequency, just measure allele frequency, this is the null module. This is the derived allele frequency in the Maasai and in the Ria. You can see anything in here is, is chance. Anything outside is not chance. At 95 uh, significance, P value of 95 significance or higher. So these are all high in the Maasai relative to Luya, and these are all high in the Luya relative to Maasai. And these are just low side. And I can tell you exactly where they are on the gene. Okay. Oops. Okay, so this is the result on a given chromosome. This is on chromosome two. This shows you FSP if you go across the chromosome. And these peaks are where something is happening, the selection is going on. And the peaks are consistently found in all three methods. At least some of the peaks are found. The blue is background. And you, you, you analyze background by, by taking the genome and just shuffling it up and repeating the analysis on the shuffled genome saying, what is the likelihood to get a false signal by chance? So it's simple enough. Uh, and if you zoom in in these regions, if you zoom in on this, this region with the LCT locus, these are the genes. You can see that there are lots of genes on this. In particular, there is this gene. Keep saying talking, talking, but I know it out. No. So uh, it's hidden, but there is a gene called the LCT gene, which is the lactase gene. And lactase gene uh, is involved in making lactase. And most of us uh, have a problem with that. Most Asians lack the ability to, to synthesize, to, to, to deal with milk as adults. In fact, no, no, no animal drinks milk as an adult. So there's the illusion that cats like, like milk. That's not true. Cats hate milk. Gives them gas just like it gives you gas and me gas. But there are people who drink milk constantly, like Northern Europeans or the Maasai, who have an adaptation. So the fact that we found the lactase gene means that we're doing something right. Oh, oops. Okay, and then if you look at the region in that region, oh, here's the lactase gene. You can see that the, that the haplotype is highly amplified. You know, this whole region is under selective pressure in the Maasai. Okay, so we thought we had something, but in biology, just because you think you have something doesn't mean anything. Because, you know, as all biologists tell you, what's the proof? They believe in what physicists have forgotten, that, that it's not enough to find something. You have to make a prediction, like Einstein did with his three, three things that he predicted. And if, however beautiful the, the theory, however you much you love the theory, if the predictions don't work out, it's wrong. It doesn't matter how beautiful it is, it's wrong. So after we did all this, they said, okay, fine. So you just took some data, you played with it, you came up with some numbers, who cares? Okay, so we found some significant slips. There's this, this, this uh, mutation in the fatty acid, which is expressed in the liver. And it has high frequency in the Maasai compared to the media. And then if you, look, if you look online, if you look in other studies, you find that Northern Germans, in Northern Germans, the same mutation is associated with lower levels of LDL and little triglycerides. And in the French, I've always wondered how the French can get away with eating cheese, butter, and wine. Everybody thought it was wine, but I think they have polymorphisms that protect them against a high cholesterol. And so uh, the French Canadians have this thing at high, high frequency. Okay, so there are other regions under selection. The, the lactase gene has a mutation which is found in other uh, Africans and, Euro and Europeans, but nobody has found this in the Maasai, and so we found it. And then other, other uh, SNPs in, in uh, various loci uh, involved with cholesterol and steroids. Uh, and then in the Framingham Heart Study, there were people who had low levels of cholesterol I don't know if you know what the Premier Arts study. The 35-year-long study where they included people 
in um, Long, on Long Island mostly in New York, in New York State, and they followed them and their families. They got free medical care. They followed all their disease states and they sequenced them over 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 time to see what was going on. And many of them, you know, had polymorphisms that were protected. And these are just chance events, right? These are not special people, just by chance. And Finnish men and women have, for some reason, this gene. Okay, so because uh, biology requires you to, to prove something, so we had to actually sequence genes at some loci to get the paper published. So we had to collect samples, and then me had to figure out how to sequence these samples. And the students are very disturbed because they had to go to the lab and learn lab techniques. These are physicists, you know, they're very scared of <coughs> experiments, but it worked. And so they got, the, they got a paper. So now there's a real question now. Why should there be any selection against a disease of the old, of old, of the elderly? Why should evolution care to keep you alive after reproductive success? The there is no grandfather effect. There is a grandmother effect, but that has to do with uh, child care. Uh, but even so, you know, why should there be protection? How would, how would evolution know to keep you alive? Because you don't leave a footprint, right? If, you, if you're going to get a disease at the age of 60, and you have only, you've had children at the age of what, 35, 40, it, it doesn't matter whether you have the wrong polymorphism or not. You're going to live long enough to have children anyway. So it's only when you, when you have SNPs that cause disease before reproductive success that they get, they get weeded out. But why should you have selection against hypercholesterolemia? Which is a hard question to answer until we talk to a cardiologist whose daughter had epilepsy. And so epileptic kids are given ketogenic diets, which are high in saturated fat. So all her life, this little girl could eat only fat until the age of chicory, cheese, butter, but could not eat vegetables, was not allowed to eat roti or sabji or anything, just high fat. And at the age of at the age of nine or ten, she developed lesions in her in her coronary arteries. So it means that a high fat diet can cause heart problems in early childhood. You don't have to wait to get old. You can actually die from from cardiac issues if you need a hundred percent. So you need some protection. And she had you know she has all of these things. So her, her father is a cardiologist and he's dealing with it, slowly weaning her off the diet, putting her on the normal diet. She'd probably need a, a, some kind of stenting by the age of 20. So it means that without protection, a high fat diet induces strong negative selection in many populations, which is why the Maasai are selective. So if, if you or I, you, probably, if I eat, makes no difference because I can just load up on statins. But if, if you eat, only cheeseburger or only metais for, let's say, six months. And I'm not sure how happy uh, your, you will be. You probably have problems. One question. Yeah. The diet that you mentioned is way out of typical, right? Yeah. Because, uh, say, yes. But does that then talk, tell you something about the typical diet should be a protection? Well, they have had this diet for a long time. And so presumably they've been selected out, you know, the ones who were, so if you, if you persisted in eating a high fat diet for a long time, like the French did, yeah. you know, the French did, yeah. then things would change. Slowly you would get selected over time. And that's what would happen to them. Otherwise you would not see a signature. You would not be able to compare them against somebody else. So evolution takes time to, to build up this kind of signature. Once it builds it up, you know, it's there. It's, it's there. The chance of, uh... I mean, this is the concept of giving their evolutionary skill like this. Yeah. Far you go from the evolutionary skill, the chance of business side. I mean, suppose if you want to feed the Maasai with the bacteria diet, I'm sure they all come down. Yeah, right. that's true. So, because they are not selected to take it as a diet. Whereas, if you take somebody who's, let's say, if you want to have a world of bacteria diet, to feed them the Maasai diet, they would have been So, somehow there is a conflict between evolutionary history. And so as long as they're aligned, you'll be okay. More software they are, the chance of very different. And they would have to be very different for multiple purposes. 
Okay, so the Maasai social customs are also strange, which your anthropologist told me. Uh, and so they practice open marriage. So sex is not allowed until the age of consent, which for them is about 18 or so. After that, you go through this ritual where you become a man, and then you can have sex with anyone. Or married women, so there is marriage, because marriage has to do with cattle, right? It has to do with who owns the cattle, right? So if you get married to someone who has a lot of cattle, then you're a rich woman. And usually the cattle belong to the men, unfortunately, it's patriarchal. Uh, and, but, but then the women are allowed to have kids with anyone, because the man may, may be old, or not be able to have children or something, doesn't matter, no cares. Any child born out of wedlock is the man's child and inherits the cattle. So, uh, older men often marry uh, women who have no kids because older men probably have a lot of cattle and so they are attracted to these younger women. And so, uh, because you get married to an older man, you know, you have, you will get many widows who will then look for somebody or to, to so, so basically cattle remain in the family, people don't count. So widows will choose partners without stigma. They prefer men with more cattle, older men. So as, as a result, this can select for protection against diseases of the elderly because it allows older women to contribute, older men to contribute to the gene pool, which normally we, we don't. Uh, well, there are some ex ex exceptions. Cian Yang had a child at the age of 90. And Burton Russell had a child at the age of 99. So uh, I don't think most of most people don't, don't have this, this privilege. Okay, so again, these are the people who worked on the project, but these are the two people who actually did the work. And um, I don't know if I have that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so Kshitij is now at Los Alamos. He's a staff member and he is uh, working on HIV. He's working on trying to find uh, procedures to keep the disease under control. HIV is now a, not not a lethal disease anymore. It, it, you can keep it, keep, you can stay alive. It's like diabetes. If you take care, you can live with it forever. And Atish started, he, he spent a postdoc at Princeton, not a postdoc, he was actually a system director. He was developing novel courses for between engineering and, and, and the arts. And he's, he's actually got a blog that you might enjoy looking at. It's called Empirical Zeal. And so he, he's a science writer now. He lives in New York and he's a freelance science writer. He's a pretty cool guy. So both of these did, guys did very well. Um, they're both in some sense in academia. Okay, so I don't know how much time I have. Probably not much. No? About five minutes, but maybe you can go on for a few minutes. A few minutes? Okay, I, I, let me go for 10 minutes. All right, so the next project I want to talk about is involves these people, so I mean three years. Kim is the head of medicine at Vanderbilt uh, University. Lorna is a surgeon. She gives us the samples that she, she's a, she cuts out, out people and she always talks to us and tells us that, you know, sometimes I can open someone and I know that this person is going to do well. And I know that this person, I don't know why. It's just the sense I have from what the tumor looks like. So a good person to talk to. Janice runs the clinical trials. Uh, Greg is a, is a pathologist at uh, the Cancer Institute. And Anil uh, is a pathologist for SRAN Genomics. The reason we included both of them is that when we asked Greg to work with us, he said he would charge $200 per sample. And when we asked Anil, he told us, if you put me on the paper, I'll do it for free. <laughs> <laughs> so we took both of them. All right, and these are all the people, but the people who did the work are, is just Anshuman, who is my graduate student, and this guy, Agi, who is a lab from Bangalore. So Anshuman uh, came to, to he, he went, did his undergraduate at MIT, and then he came to, to Rutgers because he couldn't get, um, he didn't get admission anywhere. And he, he came straight away to see me uh, and said, I want to work in biology because I'm scared of all these other students and, and, and big people, famous people. So amazingly, in three years, he wrote four papers in high impact journals. These, I don't know, none of you probably published in these journals, 
But these journals have an impact factor of in the 20s. You know, they are not quite PRL, but they're all, you know, not quite nature, but halfway to nature. And so he has, in, in three years, this was his thesis uh, list of publications, pretty good. So I, I'll tell you a little bit about that, but I want to skip the immunology part. So let me just skip the immunology part. Yeah. So in, in uh, oops, uh, I should I should share the screen. And we have problem other this full screen. Yeah, by in case if you go to slideshow, uh show. Yeah. Good? Oh. Uh, so we went to the beginning. Okay, I was sorry about that. Yes, I'm going to skip this. Keep the immune system stuff. We don't need to worry about that. All right. So, so these two gentlemen got the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for something called uh, negative immune regulation. And how, how that therapy works is that the, the purpose of your immune system is to distinguish you from not you. Very simple. You know, a virus is not you, and you is you. So your body has mechanisms to tell the immune cells, "Don't kill me." I'm a good, good person. Or, and the immune system checks to see if that's true. Um, and so this is a balance between stimulatory and, uh, and, and inhibitory signals. And uh, so tumors have to hide in, in your body. And so they, they have to fool the immune response because they produce proteins that are not normal. And so drug, drugs that block this, these, these ways in which the immune system cannot detect these tumors uh, will kill the tumor because the immune system will see the tumor and kill it. So it's not the drug that's doing the killing, it's the immune system that's doing the killing. Oh, it affects. Yes, yes, it's, it's, it's a highly toxic thing. And so you have to be careful who you give it to. It's chemotherapy and it's bad chemotherapy because it amplifies your immune response, which means that your body will start to kill itself. So you have to be very careful who you give it to. You don't want to give it to everybody. So these are the two drugs, Femalizumab and, and Epilumumab. And this is, this is the, this is the, um, so the way you, your, your immune system is trained is in lymph nodes, your immune system is presented, the killer cells are presented with peptides, train them. And if the peptide is sufficiently different, they get amplified, but there's also an inhibitory signal if the peptide is close to your normal peptide. So there is some kind of a balance. So these are all checkpoints which inhibit the immune response. And tumors amplify this inhibition. Tumors amplify this inhibition either during the training stage where the cell is now training the T cell. If you put the drug, then the training works. If you don't have the drug, the training doesn't work or at the level of the tumor itself, when the killer T cell is trying to kill the tumor, if, if the tumor amplifies these negative regulator flag, flags, then the immune system cannot recognize it. Okay, so question is who will benefit? Then what mechanisms are causing the benefit and what causes resistance and what causes recurrence? So I'll give you one example and then I'll stop. So we have a tumor board that meets once a week um, and basically uh, 315 genes in tumors from current patients are sequenced. These are patients who have failed repeated, repeated uh, therapy and uh, the results are discussed. Like, you know, if I was presenting a case because it was my patient, you would be oncologists, surgeons, clinicians who are doing uh, clinical trials or people like me would be sitting in the audience trying to understand what's going on. 
And then they make a decision right on the spot what to do. And you know, there's an argument, but then it's done. And it's, it's a collective decision. Literature is a review, recommendations are made based on facts, not just on somebody's whim. And patients are referred to specific clinical trials. Um, okay, so you can also initiate new clinical trials. So this way we get data from patients that you would normally never see data from. So there was, I'll show you a clinical case one. And this paper was published in uh, journal, uh, PCI, Journal of Clinical Immunology. Uh, so this is a lady who had uh, high, high grade endometrial cancer and she was in bad shape. Um, she, it was a long sequence of things. Uh, she had chemotherapy with all sorts of drugs. Three years later, there was metastases. <coughs> she had abdominal lymphatic adenopathy uh, and, and she, was, she was in bad shape. She was enrolled in phase one trial of this drug and she had incredible improvement, resolution of lower extremity and sustained for over 10 months. So the question was, what was going on in her, in her tumor that allowed her to work allowed this to happen. So we sequenced her gene, genes, her, her tumor, and we found 32 mutations in 315 genes. Uh, usually you have two or three. So she had a lot of mutations. And one of the mutations was in a specific gene called polymerase epsilon, which the clinicians immediately recognized because it does something called editing, which is what you asked me about. This is a gene involved in checking for DNA error during replication. And so she had a mistake in that gene, which meant that her genome was, the tumor genome was not editing at all. It was just causing lots of mutations to happen. And of course, if you have mutations, the proteins you make are weird. The immune system finds them and says, you are an enemy and tries to kill the tumor. And the only way the tumor can survive is by putting up flags. So this tumor put up, negative regulator flags that said, I'm not an enemy. It's like you wearing, you know, you're holding a Kalashnikov, but wearing Indian flags on your body. Then the guys at the door will be confused. A child in India, parents <laughs> don't know. So same thing, the tumor is doing that. Okay, so, okay, so this is the way her tumor is working. So Anshuman asked, is this a one-off thing? Is this, or are there other patients who would be benefit by this? You know, the obvious thing the physics student will ask. And he found that, so there is, a, there is a whole database that has thousands of tumors and we look through this database and they have a lot of individual tumors. So he made a plot, very simple plot. Total number of mutations, the distribution of number of mutations. So the x-axis is mutations, y-axis is how many patients have that mutation any mutation. And you can see that it's trimodal. These are low mutation rate. They're called microsatellite stable. This the clinicians know about. These are called microsatellite unstable. And these are pole E and pole D mutants. So this is the set who, according to Anshuman, would benefit from this disease, from, from this treatment. Okay, so clearly you should find them and you should, you should test for them in the clinic. And so, anyway, there were other signatures that also checked. Uh, and then he said, well, what about other cancers? Is there such a similar thing in other tumors? And TCJ has 33 solid tumors. So of course, being a physics student and having 24 hours a day to do all the science. Mm -hmm. And you know, these, these are not hard problems where you can spend a lot of time and, and come up with nothing. These are problems that if you spend the time, you'll come up with something. It may be wrong, but you'll come up with something. So he came up with, he made a strategy and the strategy was work, worked and he was able to stratify in eight tumor types, he was able to stratify them into, into classes of response, right? And he showed that if you take uh, existing data and apply his method to existing data, it works. And of course, again, as I said, biology requires you to prove prospectively that what you say is true. So we had to convince Kim Rathman, the medical school director, that please give us data and we will make a prediction and then you will check to see if we make the right prediction and it works too. So, and of course, if you draw uh, ROC curves, it works. So this means, and, and this is using standard things which you can do in the, in the clinic. You don't have to sequence the whole genome. 
So this is now standard of care. This is now used in, clinic, in clinics to stratify patients for treatment. Right. So it went from, from nothing to clinically valid in two years, which is unheard. And of course, after this, many companies like Bristol Myers Squibb and Merck developed more nuanced protocols from our methods to do, you know, and then they went through clinical trials and got federal government to agree to it. Okay, so I'm gonna skip this and just go to the end. By the way, I'm here for a while, so if you guys, oh, by the way, so after this, what Anshuman did was also interesting. He found, uh, he found, he found out that in stomach cancer, if you have an EBV infection, then this treatment works. And that also became clinical trial and, and treatment. And he also found that if you have endogenous retroviruses, so these are viruses, if you come tomorrow, you'll know more about them. These are viruses that have been living in our genome for millions of years. In fact, most of our genome, 5% to 8% of our genome, more than protein coding, has these viruses. So these are dead things that we carry around with us, like HIV, right? And I suspect that many of these viruses are responsible for our social customs, right? If you, if you, if you are monogamous, you're less likely to have sexually transmitted diseases. Um, so, so these viruses have survived in us for a long, long time, but they are, they are not functioning. So what Anshuman found was, was that the expression of these viruses is also a marker for response because the immune system turns on because these viruses are, are out of control and, um, and then it's blocked. So, And of course, once he discovered this, then we could prove what the mechanism was, because in biology, they care about mechanism more than that. And you could, so uh, Agi uh, showed that the hypomethylation is making these transcripts come out. Okay, so again, I, I'll stop because I, I think I've said enough. So uh, Anshuman is the only one who worked on this basically and this is my granddaughter saying thank you. <laughs> Happy to answer questions. The question from there. Please. Yes. Yeah. That's part of the. The um, Yeah. The examples are like 13, 15. Is that enough? Like, how would you say? Like, oh, it's not enough. We get permutations test. Yeah. And you know, the signal was so big that it was obvious. Yeah, it costs a lot of money to sequence these things. So, and also, public data is easy to get. Now, of course, there's a lot more data. There's the thousand genome project, but they don't have phenotype. Of that order, can be some composite. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. TCG had 10,000 samples over 33 tumor types. And it is mined for so much stuff. Yeah, we have, because, um, so that's what I meant by low hanging fruit. In biology, there's low hanging fruit because you can make a hypothesis that can be tested in the lab. Somebody like Ullas, if you tell him something, we'll go to the lab and mistreat a mouse. You know, <laughs> you can kill mice, you can do whatever you want with mice and, and check that it works. Um, if it doesn't work, we'll throw it away, move on or trying to figure out why it doesn't work. Because of course, mice are not like us and they have different kinds of cancers. Um, but mice are sufficiently close to us. They are 100 million years away. We, we shared a common ancestor with a mouse 100 million years ago, uh, before the age of dinosaurs ended. When did the age of dinosaurs end? A few, 66 million years, 65, 66 million years ago when the last meteor impact was in the Yucatan. And before that, so in fact, it's a lot of biology is about fun, cool stuff. Like, uh, for example, uh, why does Australia have marsupials? And we don't have, Africa does not have marsupials. Marsupials, what are Marsupials. Yeah, marsupials, like koalas. And they have completely different wildlife than, than we have. If you go to Australia, the first thing you notice is that you get on the plane, it smells different. The trees are different. The smells are completely different. The flowers are different. The trees are different. 
The reason is that when the dinosaurs died, the planets had the, the continents had already drifted apart. Sorry, when Australia broke off from Gondwana land, okay, it, it happened before the dinosaurs died. And so when there was this extinction event, marsupials arose in Australia and mammals arose elsewhere. And they were never connected. So marsupials had no mammals to eat them. And so they, they there's a lot of fascinating stuff that you can learn. And I can give you a list of books if you want to get into biology. Each, each book is, is, is a revelation. There's so much going on in that. For example, there's a, there's a book I read, which is called, um, um, which is a, a, about consciousness. It's called Incognito. So many of us think that we have free will. At least I used to think so. That I make a decision and then I, then I act. But it turns out that in your brain, the act is already underway by the time you're aware of it. So you're, there is a part of the brain that has actually decided. So basically what you're seeing as reality is an a posteriori movie stitched together after the fact. The decision is already done, made. If I'm moving my hands and I think I'm under control, not so. All of this is already orchestrated in my brain. And you can do experiments to prove that. So that was very scary. We have no free will. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So the, most of the data you presented are from human trials. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so that's a very good question. Nowadays, what they're doing is they're taking something called organoids from human tissues. They take stem cells and they grow them in some cocktail of of, of growth factors, and they are human-like. And they do experiments on those organoids. So they have a local environment, which is an environment of your tissue, and then they do experiments on that instead of mice. And that gives you different results. It's, 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 it's ethically not possible to do this experiment on, on humans. No, no, no. I'm not saying, I'm just, I'm just wondering how much. Yeah. The mice are very different from humans. In, in fact, uh, yeah, so, so for example, mice get, get breast cancer. If you induce breast cancer, they don't die from them. They never die from breast cancer. They can carry huge tumors and they eat and they happily play around. You know, you don't have to do anything to them. They're, they're, they're quite different from us. And so you're right. Many of the, the results you find in mice don't apply. Sir, uh, well, you commented that unless I created my offspring, my genes will protect me. Like, no, 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 not you. So one individual doesn't count. You, you know, all I said was that in the sense of evolution, right? All that evolution cares is that you leave behind the footprint. And you meaning you in the big sense, the average person. In so, for example, people say, uh, why why do humans live longer? Well, one reason is that we wash our hands and we we keep social distance for COVID. But also that, that we, um, the, the real reason is, and, and so people ask, um, will I live long if my parents live long or my grandparents live long? And there is an effect, but that's not the main effect. The main effect seems to be in the, at the population level, you will, the population age average longevity increases if you delay reproductive success. And the reason is, that if you delay reproductive success, then you have to live long enough to have a kid at a higher, at a bigger age. So on average, the distribution is shifted mm. for the whole population. So the reason we are living longer is partly antibiotics and partly surgery and so on, but also because of the delay. In the old days, people used to have kids at the age of 12. And you know, women would be married off at the age of eight and have babies at the age. My grandmother had first child at the age of 13. That doesn't happen anymore. And so that's the best way is to delay. 
So, but if the individuals don't, you and I don't come, unfortunately. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Just one, one more. There's one more. I want you to ask, like, the way we see we track migration, this is like we see uh, uh, how this way I trade population, which had initially same by from the one by the one. Yes. Uh, so I wanted to ask, uh, like, we track it for like, 70,000 years or something, right? For the population. So I was wondering, are there traces of the change of climate? Yeah, so there are there are footprints of changes in the climate. Uh, for example, seventy thousand years ago, there was a uh, we were in, in an ice age, right? And but there was a small what call the the there was a small period there was an interglacial period when the climate warmed up, and that's when the Africans left seventy thousand years ago, and and they migrated. Uh, they, they migrated all the way to Australia. And you would imagine that how can these primitive people 70,000 years ago cross the ocean? But the ocean was shallow because most of the water was locked in the, in the poles. Right? It was an ice age. And it was only a little bit of... So they waded across. They could wade across. Just like uh, Ceylon. Sri Lanka was connected to the Indian mainland at that time. You could just you know, take a... A uh, short walk and come home in the evening. You go to Sri Lanka and come back. So um, it was a different time, but you're right. And, and there's a nice book. If you're, if you're worried about Indian origins, there's a nice book that I will recommend. Uh, it's, it's called um, Early Indians by Tony Joseph. I don't know if you've read this book. It's a very good book, which describes the diaspora within India and how migrations into India have changed there. With the genetic makeup of, of Indians. And there's another one uh, called uh, The Gem in the Lotus, which is about India before uh, written history. You know, in, in Indians did not have written history until very recently, unfortunately. And, and so how do, you, how do you tell? You can tell by looking at language and syntax in the Vedas, or looking at, at tools and artifacts that are left behind. You can also do genetic sequencing if, if you wanted to, because it might show you things you don't want to know. There's a lot of Indians who have a lot of strong feelings about where they came from. And if somebody tells you that we came from Africa, that's not that's a no-no. Uh, it's a fact, but it might offend someone. Or that Iranians came here. And, 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 that, <laughs> and that's also a fact. <laughs> The Vedas were actually brought from Iran, not, they're not native to us. This whole sun worshipping and fire worshipping, it's from, from Iran. The old gods, which is Shiva, Vishnu, and, and, and Brahma, they are ancient, and they were here in the Harappan civilization. Um, and genetically, the Harappan civilization is still part of us, but more in the south. And, Back to no that, into India from the east. From the east. Yeah, but not all the way from the east. Yeah, so there are there are parts like Nagaland. Not from Australia. No, there was there was some, but it didn't come all the way to, to the rest of India. It didn't come to the eastern part of it, the western part of it. it. It stopped. And you can see that in the characteristics of people. You can look at facial characteristics, which don't change very much. Over time. Anyway, so that's a different talk. So sure. I, I will give this talk. You're welcome to come. Thank you. Thank you.